Today we will be discussing the notion of structures called a struct mechanism in C++. How do we define structures and how do we use them? We will then look at files. We are familiar with files. We use files to store our programs. We use data files as input to our programs. We often produce text output which can be redirected to a file. So we are familiar with files in general. However, we have never processed a file specifically from within a program. All our interaction with the rest of the world has been with C in and C out so far. Files constitute a very important mechanism of storing your data and therefore Handling files, reading and writing data to, from and to files is an important requirement. Very specifically, we'll discuss how files are treated as streams of bytes by C++. We'll look at an example of creating a text file. Unlike the files which originate from keyboard, or are targeted to terminal, which are essentially sequential files, the files which are stored on disk can be accessed at any position that you please. Essentially then, a file on a disk is almost like an array of characters. We shall see how we can exploit this fact by utilizing the ability to position the reading or writing point within of this file to permit us direct access or random access as it is called. The last 10 minutes of the lecture, we'll discuss the course projects. I will define the reporting process, deadlines and other things because the course projects constitute, as you know, as big a chunk of evaluation as the NCM exam and therefore it is important. We are familiar with the notion of array. An array permits us to define a collection of similar objects, say roll numbers or salaries or names or whatever. So you can have an array of 100, 1000, 10,000 elements, but each element is of the same type. There are occasions, however, when you have to represent data which has different attributes. Take, for example, a student. Now, when you want to wish to represent some information, some basic information about students, let's say you want to pick up the roll number, the name, the hostel number, and room number. Of course, in real life, if you are dealing with data related to students, you would have much more information. We saw, for example, in our mid-semester exam itself, you would have, you would require to store marks for question 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 2A, bonus marks, total, and this is only about mid-sem. There would be end semester exam, there would be assignments, there would be project, there would be project viva, etc., etc. So just the marks alone would constitute a large number of pieces of information that you would like to store for a student. But what we are trying to describe here is the situation where the information that we want to represent about a student is not all of the same type. For example, we know that the hostel number in IIT are numerics, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Room numbers are numerics. Name is a character string. Roll number is also a character string with nine, nine characters or up to nine characters. Now, you would like to specify these components such that they belong to a student. How do you show that they belong to a student? You could, of course, have, let's say you want to store information about 1,000 students, then you could have one array of roll numbers, for example, a two-dimensional array, another array of hostel numbers, third array of room numbers. But the third array of room numbers 
if seen outside the context of the associated roll number will not give you any information. So how do you sort of relate? The ideal thing will be if you can stipulate a single record for a student, just like you have one record in the academic office or in your hostel coordinating unit or something like that. Typically there will be one page per student which will, which will record the student's name, roll number, hostel number, room number, address, parents, whatever, whatever. So something of that sort we would like to do. The simple data types that we have, integer, float, and cap, do not permit us to define such a complex structure. However, most programming languages permit mechanisms to define such structures. The C++ mechanism is called struct. Struct is a short form for structure. Structure can be viewed as an abstract data type. So just like you have integer, you have floating point, you would have some structure. Here is an example, struct student info. So student info is not a name of a variable. Student info is name of a structure. And here we define that student info in turn will consist of the following parts. So you describe the parts exactly as you would describe in any other block starting curly bracket and closing curly bracket. Look at what we have written here, char roll 10. This can house a roll number of up to 9 characters. Char name 36 can house a name up to 35 characters. Int hostel, well hostel is an integer number. Int room, room is an integer number. Let's say these are the four components, roll number, name, hostel and room, which we were interested in recording in our data and processing. What this facility tells us is that these four components are defined to be part of a new data type called student info. And just as I have a type called int or float where I can say float x or int y, similarly I can say student info s or st or whatever. So this student info, or rather struct student info, becomes a new data type. Here could be a declaration of such a data type. Suppose I use that structure which I had defined there as a new data type, then s is the name of a variable. Just as I could say int s or float s or char s, I can now say struct student info s. That means S now is a variable of the type structure whose components are defined as in student info. Obviously, since there are multiple components and I could declare many variables, S1, S2, S3, whatever, I must now be able to identify a component belonging to one of the variables that I have defined, in this case S. The way I do that is by using a dot. So, it is called a qualifier. S dot name means the name component of the variable S. S dot role means the role component of the variable S. S itself is a variable of type struct student info. So watch what I am doing, having defined this struct, I am reading out the name, role, hostel, room, in which order I read is completely immaterial. How I process these four components is entirely up to me. But each one of these four components have been well identified and they are tagged to a particular declared variable by putting that variable name followed by a dot. Let's say I have read this information and I want to print it. Just for the sake of explaining how structures could also be used as arguments or parameters in a function, I have written a small function here called print student info. To that function I am passing not a variable, not an array, but a structure. A rather a structure variable. The struct info, student info variable s is being passed to the student, print student info function. We shall see that function shortly, but at the end when I come back, I simply return 0 and n. In short, this is a dummy main program sort of, which reads one student's data pertaining to these four components, gets it printed by calling a function and quits. How would that function look like? First of all, the function does not return anything, 
So I have declared it as void. The name of the function is print student info. The parameter inside, observe ordinarily I would say int something, float something. This time I have to say struct student info something. So note that while I call this an abstract data type and I have given it a name student info, in C++ syntax the complete name for this abstract data type is struct student info. Just student info won't do. So struct student info st, another variable which I am using. What it will mean is, let's go back to the previous page. When I call this print student info with s as a struct, as parameter, this s logically should be handed over to that function. One point is to be noted here, since struct is a complex data structure, just like an array, it is not copied in its entirety. But like an array, a pointer to the struct is passed. That is automatically done. So when I come out here, when I say st.name, I mean the name component of the argument that or parameter that I have received. st.role, st.hostel, st.room. Notice that I am trying to use printf just to illustrate whatever we just recently studied. So I am printing 35 character string, the name, then a blank, then 9 characters of up to 9 characters of row number, up to 2 digits of hostel and up to 3 digits of room. And then I am just getting back. There is only one question that remains. Ordinarily when I write int st or float st, the type int and type float is already known to the fun this function or any number of functions that I write. But struct student info is not something which C++ has defined. Struct student info I have defined. How does this function know what struct student info is? Remember that the function definition will come first and this will be followed by the main program. So there is some lacuna here and we shall visit this issue later when we discuss the scope of our declarations. It is required that such declarations which are used by functions as well as main program be declared in global scope. That means they should be known everywhere. Just as when we say using namespace std, then everything called c in, c out, etc., etc. is known globally. All the functions which are included by include uh, IO stream, etc. are known globally. Similarly, we would like our defined uh, things also to be known globally. We shall see that later. This is typically done through use of header files which are written externally and they are included just as we have other include statement, but we shall see that later. It is very, very important to understand the similarity between struct definition with the data types and the variables corresponding to structure with the variables and arrays that we use. Here is some more example to illustrate that. The struct itself does not define any variable nor any storage is allocated. So when I say struct something, I am actually defining a new type. No storage is allocated because no variable, no array is defined. This new type can be used just as we use in float, char, etc. in C++. To understand what is the mechanism, is a small illustration, we will go through it very quickly. Consider float as the data type. When we say float, what does it convey to us? It tells us that float is a structure. You look at the internals of the float. Remember we said float number will be stored in 4 bytes. But is it like a unsigned int or something is a continuum of bits? No. A float itself has two components, a mantissa path and an and a exponent path. And internally these two components are separate components of the type float. It so happens that C++ has defined the float as a native type, so we don't have to worry about it. But when we look at the structure of float, we recognize that there will be a mantis and exponent. We then know what kind of value that can be stored and we also know what type of operations can be performed on this. Let's visit our Dumbo again. When we say float, what would it mean to our Dumbo? 
it means that a variable of this type will have to be allocated 4 bytes of memory. It means that the internal representation will consist of two components, mantisa and exponent. And it also means that the arithmetic operations will have to be performed by taking cognizance of mantisa exponent being separate, etc. All this is understood by Dumbo the moment they see the word float. Next, when I define some variables, let's say I declare variables float x comma y equal to 23.14. I am declaring two variables, one just declared, another declared and initialized to a value. It is at this time when the declaration happens that variables get positions allocated in the memory. Any initialization etc. is done here. So, so far when the C++ looks at float, it just understands this. But when it looks at float x comma y equal to 23.14, two locations are created, 4 bytes each, x and y. x contains something unknown because no initialization is done at this stage. y contains 0.2314E2. Observe I have tried to indicate that what is stored internally is a normalized form mantisa. That means the decimal point will be equivalent decimal point will be assumed to be at the starting position. So this is how C++ will handle your declarations, memory allocation and so on. In exactly the same fashion, when I declare a struct, let's say this is a struct I have declared, struct new type, new type is my choice, whatever, abracadabra, whatever with the name. I, it has three components, int a, float y, char ch. Now the moment Mr. Dumbo sees this struct new type, this means that I am actually defining a new type. And this will have three components, one will be the int type, another will be float type and still another will be char type. It is also noted by C++ at this stage itself that if and when variables are declared of this new abstract data type, each one of them will occupy how many bytes? 4 bytes for int a, 4 bytes for float y, and, four, uh, and 1 byte for char ch. So 4 plus 4 plus 1, 9 bytes will have to be allocated if and when I declare variables. This is what then it would mean to Dumbo that all variables of this type will have Exactly, sorry, there is a mistake here, should be 9 bytes, right? Just correct that, 9 bytes of memory. There will be 3 components, each of the indicated standard type and appropriate operations will have to be done on each of these components. So this is what struct new type means. When I actually declare, this is the additional sentence, struct new type where, some where variable I have declared, okay. I can declare any number of variables, but the moment I declare this var, C++ now does the following. C++ will allocate memory equivalent of 4 plus 4 plus 1, 9 bytes, not 17 bytes, this is wrong here. It will allocate 9 bytes of memory and it will know now that var dot a, var dot y, var dot ch will be the three components on which normal operations may be performed in the program. For example, if in my program somewhere I have a statement var dot a equal to 58, var dot y equal to 23.14 and var dot ch is equal to character w, then Dumbo will perform these operations. It will put value 58 here, it will put 0.2314 e2 here, it will put character w here. So the memory allocation happens when the variables of a struct type are declared and actual values get in only when appropriate assignment is done. Assignment can be done by reading a value as we saw in the example of student info. It could be assigned by any normal computations. Also, once you understand that this is a abstract type, then just as you can declare variables of the standard type and also arrays of standard type, it is perfectly possible to declare an array of struct. And that is what really makes things very convenient. What could this mean? Struct student info S1000. It means it's an array of 1000 elements. Each one of those elements is of the type student info. So for example, it is perfectly correct for me to say 
एस आई डॉट नेम देन दिस वुड रिफर टू द कैर आर ए नेम फॉर ए पर्टिकुलर आई एच स्टूडेंट आई कुड से एस आई डॉट रोल एस आई डॉट रूम एस आई डॉट हॉस्टल एटसेट्रा इनफैक्ट सिंस नेम इट सेल्फ इज एन आर ए आई कुड हैव नेम The, the, just this name I could use in what I call a C out or C in statement. But if I want to manage some of the character positions within the name, I could have another thing called J here. This J refers to Jth element of name. This I refer to Ith student, and there are thousand such students. This gives you an extremely compact and powerful mechanism of representing data and handling data in your programs. i would expect that most of your complex data type definitions in your programming projects would utilize this structure very adequately let us now consider the notion of files in c++ some of these things we already know from our exposure to the files as we use them but some are new things so files are a large collection of bytes known stored outside the main memory known typically on a disk known files on the disk are managed by the operating system there is a component of the operating system called file system which manages this now this file system organizes files in directories and subdirectories you are all familiar with them within a subdirectory or directory there could be a file each file can be created data can be written to it and data can be retrieved from it we know that whenever we edit a program we store it as dot cpp that means we are adding data to that file whenever we give that as a parameter to c++ c++ compiler reads that file so data can be retrieved from it i can delete file whatever what data can also be inserted into or deleted from an existing file that is exactly what you do when you use an editor program don't forget that g edit is nothing but a program someone like you has written it possibly in c++ itself or c and you use that to read a file edit a file modify a file store a file back each file has properties it has a name it has a path it has a set of permissions except for the name we don't have to do much with this occasionally we have to worry about the path the physical location of a file and its properties are known to the operating system so files are external to our program here is a typical disk drive we will not spend much time on looking at it right now just to give you a glimpse i have a, uh, a, a an animation describing how the disk works at an appropriate point in time when we discuss the direct access binary files i will show you that at this stage suffice it to say that there are platters like this which are coated with magnetic material typically on both sides ordinarily when you have a cd drive or a floppy drive you have a single platter which is mounted on a spindle a motor rotates the spindle so as the spindle rotates the disk rotates there is a read write arm in case of cds the read write arm is optical in case of hard disk or floppies it is magnetic this read write arm can move forward and backward and there are there is another motor which controls that once you invest in a motor to rotate a disk and once you invest in a motor to move this forward or backward it is only sensible to use the same spindle to have more disk and the same motor to have more arms so that you economize on the totality and increase the volume of information that you can read or write the reading and writing is done very simply there are logical tracks on this 80 100 200 they are not physically marked when you format a disk these tracks are formed by the operating system within the track there are sectors and usually you read or write one sector full of information and the way you read or write is suppose you want to read this information which is on this sector all that you need to do is move this arm such that the arm head comes exactly on top of this track currently it is somewhere here it will be moved here and then you just wait 
Let the disc rotate. As it rotates, this part will come under the head and you just read that information out. In exactly the same way, you can write that information. That is why the disc is called a direct access device. You can read or write information at absolutely any point on the disc. Of course, the disc will contain not just one file, but thousands of files distributed amongst hundreds of directories, many belonging to different people, etc. All that management is done by the operating system. But just as I can regard the whole disk as if it's an array of characters, because I can go to any character that I want by this mechanism. Similarly, within a file, I can always regard a file on the disk as if it's an array of characters. Logically, it is an array of characters. And within my program, I would be able to say, get me the first byte, get me the last byte, get me the 5434th byte, etc. It is possible to do so on the disk and that is why it is called a direct access device. We shall see this direct access mechanism being exploited in our programs at a later stage. Currently, we will just look at sequential files, which is one of the file types. Here is something more on the operating system's view of files. So this we have seen, files residing on disks are organized into directories and subdirectory. Every user is given a home directory. And for the operating system, a file contains a number of bytes, which is the size of the file. Now, when I have a file called .cpp, the operating system can infer that it contains a text, which is a C++ program. If I have a file called .txt, the operating system can infer that this possibly contains some text data. However, there is nothing sacrosanct about it. You may choose to store some native binary format integer numbers in a file and call it something .txt. You will be essentially cheating operating system and other programs. So the point is that what is contained inside the file its logical interpretation is left to the programs which either create that file or process that file. So, operating system does not take responsibility for the meaning of the bytes that are there in the file. Operating system's responsibility is to store the data of so many bytes in a file which is the size of the file. It will maintain it intactly, uh, uh, correctly. Anytime you want to read, it will give you those bytes and you can do a whole lot of processing on the files. There are some capabilities. When the operating system reads data from a file, it is capable of detecting when there is no more data left. This is called end of file. Remember the sentinel mechanism that we used when we were scanning arrays and we reach the end of a particular array, we want to say, end of array and we put some negative value, something, something, some arbitrary thing we did. In case of this files, whenever we are reading data from this file, if there is no more data, no artificial character is sent. Instead, a separate flag is set by the operating system and the operating system is capable of conveying that flag to our program independently, that there is no more data. So what you tried to read, it was not possible because there is nothing left in the file. That is called end of file. So this flag is given to the user program by the operating system. Files coming out of keyboard or going to terminal are treated as special files. So a keyboard is supposed, is, is giving to OS a sequence of bytes. If you want to indicate end of file while giving the input, you don't want to give any more input. You want to artificially tell your program that end of file has been reached, you type control D. That's the Unix way of saying that data has ended. This is again known to you. Usually whenever your program comes into existence, three files are automatically created and opened, std in, std out, and std err, and these are connected by default to the keyboard and to the terminal. Again, this we know already. I have just included it for the sake of completeness. And when we use redirection, we can say instead of std in, read data from in data.txt. And instead of putting the output on std out, put data on out data.txt. Again, this is well known to us. 
but we are not looking at these niceties. All of these are being done outside our program. When I execute dot slash a dot out within that program, I am not mentioning any file by name and I am not doing any explicit file processing. I am doing it implicitly by saying C in and C out. Later on we will relate C in and C out as important operators of a stream called STD in and STD out. That we will do when we discuss the object oriented features. But currently we will look at the conventional file processing mechanisms available in C++. So to recapitulate, a file is regarded as a stream of bytes. This is the reason why what you include in your program at the top is called include IO stream. So all streaming input and output, in fact if you don't say include IO stream, C in and C out would probably not be recognized. A file is defined using a pointer. We are familiar with pointers. Here is another case. There is no other way of defining a file. You can define int, you can define float, but you want to define a file. As far as the program is concerned, file is a pointer. Star p, int star p points to some integer location. File star fp will point where? This file star fp pointer points to something which the operating system maintains. Remember, all files are external to ourselves. The responsibility of reading and writing data from and to a file <coughs> is actually that of operating system. In fact, for every file on the disk that you handle, operating system will create a buffer to temporarily maintain the data read in and the data to be written out. And actually this pointer points to what is known as a file handle, a mechanism, complex structure within the operating system. So when you declare file star fp, fp is a pointer, but this pointer is meant to point to something outside the program. A file must be opened before you can process it and the data can be accessed by reading or writing again using standard functions. We shall see what those standard functions are. As far as we are concerned, the standard library functions for reading or writing data from std in and to std out, std err are c in and c out. We are familiar with that. We said that all files must be opened before use. Who opens these files? These are automatically opened by the operating system. The moment you say dot slash a dot out and your program is loaded into the memory, intrinsically the operating system will allocate three pointers which will be available inside your program and these three pointers will point to three files, std in, std out and std ER. Now for this files as I mentioned, since a file can be considered to be an array of characters, C++ permits us to position a pointer. This pointer is not the file point. This pointer is a position pointer. So within a file, I can position a pointer saying go to 1713th byte directly and read one or more bytes from that position. As I mentioned, we shall discuss this particular feature later when we discuss the binary files and direct access. But this is an extremely important capability. If we did not have this capability, we will end up reading huge amount of data sequentially to search out something. Remember what I mentioned once that Suppose in a higher secondary examination conducted in state of Maharashtra, all roll numbers and marks are recorded and they are stored in a file. And one student's marks are required to be found out. The only way you can find that out is read all the records from the disk. Even if you have them in memory, it takes non-trivial time to scan all of them. If they are on disk, you are sunk. So you need a mechanism to say, give me the marks for 453rd student. Ideally, you would like to say, give me the marks for roll number so and so. We shall see how exactly roll number and position can be mapped later through additional files called index files. However, what is important is that positioning for reading or writing is possible. And of course, just as I must open a file, I must also close the file at the end. There could be errors while opening or closing a file. 
Why could there be an error? Suppose in my program I say open a file with such and such name, mydata.txt. However, the file which exists in my directory is not called mydata.txt. It is simply called data.txt. Obviously, when I say open a file, I am not going to, my program is not going to open it. Actually, the program will ask operating system to open that file by giving it the name. The operating system will find that such a name does not exist. So, it can't open the file. That means there will be an error. Why could there be an error while closing a file? Suppose I have opened a file in which I am writing a lot of data. And I am writing records after records, bytes after bytes after bytes. When it finishes, I want to close the file. However, while writing the data, suppose there is no disk space left on the disk. The bytes cannot be written more. I will get an error in write. Suppose I have written all the data and I now say close. But in the close statement, either I have made some mistake or when I give a close statement, at that time operating system encounters some problem with the disk. It is unable to close the file. In all such cases, where a file can be either not open properly or not closed properly, an error is given by the operating system to my program, which can be tested, which can be examined. Just like you say, if n not equal to 0 or if pointer, whatever, whatever, null, you can test these and appropriately take actions as you wish. So, here is again a recap. Star FP will point to the file object. This part we are not going to see through an example. The example that I have chosen is simply for opening a file, reading or writing something and closing a file. But later I will use this feature, so I am just explaining it. Consider these to be sequence of bytes. So this is my file. This is the 0th byte, first byte, second byte, and it goes on last byte. How many bytes? Size bytes. Just as I have a function to get length of a string in my memory, there is a function to get size of a file from the operating system. So you know exactly what is the first byte, what is the 0th byte, last byte. Now this pass could be an integer variable in your program, and there are mechanisms, there are function calls to say, please set pass to a particular position. Once I set position to a point, I can either read bytes from here or write bytes there. Of course, if something else is written here already, and if I write something else, the previous thing will be destroyed, like in a memory location. Indeed, I use this feature to what we call update information. Imagine, for example, that this particular location contained, let's say, total marks of a student. Not one byte, so it will be, let's say, these four bytes. So it is a float value. These four bytes contain uh, the floating point number, which represents the marks of a student. And let's say the marks have been updated because of the review of the uh, answer paper. So three marks have been added. So modified marks have to be written now. I have written all other information about the student in accompanying bytes. It does not make sense for me to write that student's information again somewhere else. If I can find out somehow that this student's information is from here to here and the marks four bytes start from here. These four bytes being integer or floating point, I will have to construct a floating point value inside my memory, position this array here and say write this marks, which is float marks, in the next four bytes. Whatever be the old marks, delete them and rewrite. This is an excellent facility that I have. Observe, I do exactly the same thing when I change the value of a variable or an array element in my program. But variables and array elements have temporary existence. They are not persistent. The moment my program execution goes, arrays also disappear. Whereas the data on the disk is persistent, and that is the most important aspect of the disk file. Once you write the data there, the data remains indefinitely. So a file can be either sequential file or random access file. If it is a random access file, I can use these possibilities of positioning a pointer and so on. If it is a sequential file, then I can read data only one record at a time. Most of the sequential files are text files. Now, when I say I can read records one after another, how does the operating system know when one record ends and another record starts? 
there are only two possible ways. One is, each record is of a fixed length, 123 bytes, for example. Somehow I should tell the operating system that each record is 123 bytes. Or, I should know it and I should read 123 bytes every time. Alternately, if my records are of varying size, as it happens in text file with different lines, then there has to be a mechanism for the operating system to know when a record has ended. And we all know what is that delimiter for a record, it is the new line character. So in a text file, whenever a new line character comes, one record has ended, another record has started. In fact, get string function that we use capitalizes on this fact that a backslash n or a new line character is end of record or record delimiter or record terminator and it will read all bytes up to end of record. Similarly, when I write a text line as a string, then if that line terminates with a backslash zero, then that will be considered to be one record by the disk file. In case of binary files, of course, records are usually of a fixed size, this is something that we shall discuss at a later point. When I have files, I can do a variety of things with those files. Mostly I will be opening a file for reading data or opening a file for writing data. It is possible for me to open a file for both reading and writing, which is called updating the data. It is possible for me to open a file to append data. For example, I have evaluated 250 students' papers. I have inserted their records in a file. Now, five days later, my TAs give me remaining 250 students' data. I want to just insert these additional 250 students' data beyond whatever was recorded earlier. This is called appending. Appending in a file is almost like you have a common file of papers with say 25 pages and you insert additional 10 pages into it. You generally do that at the end. So that is exactly what is done in append. R stands for read, W stands for write, A stands for append. This is about the mode of opening for the objective whether you want to read, write or append. You also want to specify whether the file is a binary file or a text file. The default is text file. If it is not a text file, then you have to say B for the word binary. These are various ways of specifying. So these are called modes and these are prescribed in the open statement for the file as we shall see shortly. If I want to read, for reading only, I will just use R. R means text, RB means reading, but file is binary. W means write, WB means write a binary file. R plus is for reading and writing. R plus B or RB plus is for binary reading and writing. For creating, writing and reading, W plus. There is a difference between these two, which we shall see later. For appending to a file, a or AB. So they are very, very straightforward and simple things. In most of your processing, you will require to open files for reading or open files for writing or open files for appending and occasionally you will require to open files for reading and writing. So as I said, sequential files are able to read write data only in a sequence. The position pointer is then managed by the read write functions automatically in consonance with the operating system. And most text files are treated as sequential files. And formatted input and output will always happen on text files. In fact, std in and std out. Or the file that you read from by when you use c in and the file you write to when you say c out are text files. By redirection you can put them onto the disk or read from the disk, but they are essentially text files and they are sequential files. CSTDIO, C standard library for input output, has to be included if you want to use any one of these functions. As I said, first you have to open a file. So this you say f open file name, comma more. This is the string file name by which the operating system knows it. My data dot txt, marks dot txt, whatever, whatever. More is as we saw the more. F close will close a file. 
the way you use the open statement this is the example you say fp you must declare file star fp somewhere so fp is one of the pointers you can declare 20 file pointers if you want you can open 20 files simultaneously but every file must be associated with the file point this pointer fp when you declare it it has no value no association so it is the f open statement which associates a pointer to a file point so when you say fp is equal to f open my file dot txt comma r the first string says name of the file physical name of the file as known to the operating system is my file dot text and the mode under which i want to open this file is r i want to open it for reading when i execute this f open library call the operating system opens that file and allocates the file pointer to fp subsequently all read write statements that i do on fp will actually be done on this file when i finish the processing i close the file by saying f close fp what are the various functions available you are familiar with scanf well you can have just as you have scanf scanf means standard in std in but if you want to use scanf on a file you say f scanf f scanf fp comma whatever whatever you write in scanf you can write here there is also an s scanf and that is interesting c++ is capable of treating a string within your program as if it was a text file and it can read from a string or it can write to a string so just as you say scanf or printf for reading from a string or writing reading from input file string or writing to an input file string you can also say s scanf and s printf so this is because c++ is capable of treating a string here you give string instead of a file point so c++ treats as if this is a file but with a limited size whatever is the size of the string you are familiar with get string so i can use get s but i can also use f get s which means get the string from a named file just as i can say get s i can say put string and i can say f put string similar to get string there is a function which is quite popular which reads one character at a time get c corresponding to get c for a standard in you have f get c put c and f put c the last one which i have mentioned here cf seek will not discuss this but i think you can guess that f seek will have to do with the positioning of the pointer in that large this size so f seek fp offset when etc we'll discuss this later incidentally this is an extremely valuable reference I think I had mentioned it once earlier. I have asked a few students, but very few people seem to have even looked at this. It's a very powerful reference on the net, free, and I think you should look at it. So this is actually a C++ dot com site, and this has practically all the explanations that you ever need about the features of C++, including some simple examples. it is not a collection of solution of problems but there are examples illustrating the use of this feature and that feature and that feature i think you should definitely look at this site and try to see what information you need whether you get it there so this is a reference this particular thing i have taken it from this site within that the reference material within that c library within that c stdio so there are sections which describe all of these things here is a sample program for creation of a file just to illustrate that what i am creating what i am writing to is a different information than what i am reading because text file how could i copy a file into a new file very simple i could write a program which will read one line from c in and produce one the same line on c out and i could redirect input from one file redirect output to another file i would have copied that file but if i want to create a file which has different information 
just to show that there is some processing that is happening. This is some arbitrary processing I have included. That is, I will read one line from a text file, then I will prefix five stars to each line. Suppose the line was 100 characters long, I will make a new line which is 105 characters long. First five positions I will put star, Jabardast. And the remaining 100 positions I will copy what were the 100 characters in that line. Just to show that I am reading something, processing something and creating output onto another file. The only thing is I am not going to use input redirection, I am not going to use C in, C out in that sense, but I am going to use file processing. So I am going to open each of these files and do the process. For this purpose, I am including IO stream as usual, I am including C string because I will be manipulating strings and I am including CSTDIO. The old version of this which was available as a standard in C programming language and some of you are familiar with Turbo C would remember that, it was called stdio.h which is the header file for standard input output library. In C++, it takes the form of CSTDIO. Here is the program. I am defining file, star in file, star out file. So I am declaring two pointers. These are two file pointers. Please note, these are not position pointers within a file. These are actually files. Okay. So, in file is expected to point to an input file which I will open for reading obviously, out file to point to output. Names again are my choice. I have a file name because I want to give a file name to open a file. I have this int i and count, it's okay. I have an input line which is 100 bytes long which means it can store up to 99 characters because backslash 0 will be accommodate, will have to be accommodated. I have an output line which is 105 positions. As I explained, I want to artificially put first 5 positions to be stars here and then copy this line here. Since I am going to put first 5 positions always as star, I am doing this initialization here. For i equal to 0, i less than 5, i plus plus, output line i is equal to star because I am not going to disturb these 5 positions ever. So output line, an array of 105 elements will contain first 5 stars. Now what I want to do is very simple. I want to open an input file whose name I know. I want to create an output file whose name I want to take from you because you have a choice. Open these two files, read one line from one file, put it in the output line appropriately after the stars and write it to the output file. Keep on doing this, when the input file ends, detect that end properly and stop writing files, close both the files. That is the objective. So let us see what this initial part of the program does. It says in file equal to f open. I hope you recall the f open statement. The f open statement will open a file and will create a pointer which will be allocated to in file, whatever I have declared here. Let's say mid same marks.txt is my file. I know this file I want to read and copy. I am, re re I am going to open it for reading, so the mode is R. It is as simple as this. F open, name of the file, comma, R. It will open the file for reading. I allocate this to in file. Of course, by mistake, I might be running this program from a directory which does not contain this file. Then the operating system will face problems because the operating system will not find this file. And I won't be able to read anything anyway. So as per the standard practice, if for some reason the file is not opened, I would like to check for it. Like most functions in C++, if f, f open fails to open a file, it gives a null pointer return to in file. Otherwise, it's a valid pointer. In fact, whenever you do activities with pointers, the standard way of C++ saying, sorry, I could not do what you asked me to do, and it in turn it returns a null pointer. So if I check whether in file is null, N-U-L-L, -L, null, then I output input file open error, return 1, end of the program. If there is no problem, then I proceed further. Remember what our specification was? I want you to read this input file, but I want to create an output file whose name I want to take from you. So I am saying 
give output text file name and I read the string using conventional C. Notice this I could not have done if I was using redirection. Because redirection means everything must come from that file from which I am redirecting. So terminal and keyboard are available to me for interaction. I am processing the files explicitly in my program. Using that, I collect from you the file name, which is a string here. Again, I open an output file with this name, f open, file name and for w. Again, I assign the pointer which is returned by the operating system to out file and again I check whether I could open that file or not. The file could not have been opened for a variety of reasons. Just to give you one arbitrary reason, there is a quota system often deployed whenever this space is allocated to multiple users. I might have stuffed my quota completely and have no space to open a new file. The operating system will, even in that circumstances, give you an error saying I couldn't open a file. So even while opening a file for writing, when you are creating a new file, you could have a problem. Anyway, if that problem exists, just like you checked it here, you check it whether the out file pointer is null and if it is null, you take the appropriate action and come out. So by this time, you have opened the two files, both files are opened correctly, you have initialized the first five positions of the output line and you are now ready to read input lines and write them. And this is done by the standard mechanism. I start with some count equal to zero. I read the first line by using f get s. f get s is what? Get a string up to the end of line. So I will get this entire line, input line. 100 is the maximum number of characters. Either that or till I find the new line character. That is the characteristic of get s. Same characteristic works for f get s. So I give the string in which, uh, the array in which I have to uh, put the string, the maximum number of uh, characters I have to read and the file pointer. This is the sequence in which you prescribe these parameters. The first line could be read or if the file is blank, even first line will not be read. I do not know what has happened. And I have to read not just the first line, but the second line, third line, fourth line, etc. till the file ends. In all such situations, what do we do? We read the first line separately, then set up a while loop, and after processing that first line, before coming back to the next iteration, we read the next line. If there is no second line, the while loop will bomb, and I will get out. If there is no first line also, while loop will bomb, and I will get out. The way what I am checking in the while loop is, has the in file ended? And that check is done by another function called, called function file end of file. That is FEOF, FEOF in file has in file ended. If the in file has ended, operating system will return true. While not end of file, I will keep on doing this. Okay. So what do I do now? I increment the count. I have an input line. I want to copy this input line, five positions removed in the output line, because first five positions are star. Observe how I use the pointers. I copy input line, but the starting point is not output line, output line plus five. So zero, one, two, three, four has stars, from fifth position onwards up to hundred, I want to copy. So this is what mem copy does, and after getting this, I will use f put s which is exactly the opposite of f get s. I got the string from in file, I output the string on out file. And after having done that, I read the next line and go back to the while. So you'll agree that this iteration will keep reading one line from an input file, keep writing, keep putting that line onto the shifted position of output line and keep writing it there. And when this file ends, when this condition is no more true, I'll come out here. I'll simply close out file, simply close in file. Nothing is to be done. I can actually go home. I have added these few lines merely to sort of verification process. After all, I created a file. Have I really created? Well, what is the uh, thing I am doing here? 
read and print three lines from the output file. Just like that. This also illustrates one more thing. Earlier, I had opened the out file for output with W. The name is same, whatever you have given me. Now I am opening the same file with the same name, file name, what you have given, but for reading. And I am now calling it in file. So in file and out file are merely pointers within my program. I can associate any file with those pointers. Originally I associated an output file with that pointer and I created that file. Now having closed that file, that pointer is free. And I am using that pointer to open the same file but in read mode now. Read mode, when I open a file, it is effectively rewound to the beginning position. And the next few statements will actually read data. So I'm just printing three, three records, just for the sake of confirmation. For i equal to 0 to 3, get a string and output that string. That's all. And I'm putting a count number that is i here. So this is what, when I execute the program, this is what will happen. You will recall that this was the kind of lines that I had for mid-same performance. So mid-same marks.txt will contain these. I have serial number, roll number, name, batch number, etc. But now, by reading those lines and by adding these stars, I have created a line which is star, 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 and all this, etc. And this 0, 1, 2 is nothing but my eye. So this verifies that the program works correct. So is this clear? How do you handle text files, okay. You may want to experiment with reading, writing. You may, some of you who are adventurous might want to experiment whether for text files, can I handle data directly? Can I directly go to a position and write something? Can I update something? If I can, then how I can make it meaningful? Because if my different, if my different lines are having different length, different number of characters, then going to a specific position will have no meaning. Then I will think that, all right, even in a text file, can I stipulate that every record will be exactly say 100 bytes long only? And I will ensure that my actual data is padded with blanks here and there, so that I have exactly those many lines. And then I will be able to say, go to 534th student record by directly positioning it at the beginning of the 534th line and read that line. This is something I would like you to experiment. Now, as I said, I would like to spend 10 minutes on describing the projects that you have to do. So, as I had mentioned, this is a chance to you to apply your programming knowledge to solve a larger problem and you get a test of professional software development. A lab batch will work on an allocated project. The project allocation will be completed by this Wednesday. Each batch should have divided itself into three teams. All of you have done that? You have submitted your teams, team leaders, etc., etc. Ordinarily, you should have four students. If you have more than 12 students in a lab batch, one batch may have five students. If you are less than 12, one batch may have three students. And the team leaders will coordinate the batch activity, submissions for each team to be made by the team leader, submission for the batch to be made by any one of the team leaders. These are open-ended projects essential. So if you want, your entire batch can work continuously without doing anything else for six months. And you can do an enormously large amount of project and still the project will not be finished. That is the nature of real life problems. The programs that you write never are able to completely meet the requirements of functionality. That is why software keeps on increasing larger and larger and larger it becomes. Teamwork will be most important here as I had mentioned. You have to balance your teams, so efforts by individuals will be skewed. Somebody may be writing more programs, somebody may be doing more testing, somebody may be doing more documentation, somebody may be doing other coordination. You have to judiciously distribute the work, learn to take decisions, learn to discuss, design, document and review. I'll be putting up by this Sunday a small eight-page write-up 
on the basics of software engineering. That is the self study material. I would like you to read that. We'll discuss that briefly on Tuesday and Wednesday lectures. You'll have to do activity allocation. It is not possible for a student from a batch to say that nobody gave me work, so I didn't do anything. Work involves not just programming, but various other things. And minimally, every student should write at least some programs of the function. Actual programming work must be done by every student. But qualitative and con quantitative contributions by students is what will be taken into account. I'll put all of this in Moodle uh, uh, by evening. Now, this is important. This is something which you may never have done. Some of you might have a habit of writing daily diaries. But all professionals, particularly software professionals, are required to write their professional diary every day. It is called timesheet. So if, for example, I work for eight hours a day in, let's say, Tata Consultancy Services or Infosys or wherever, then I am required to record that these two hours I discuss this problem with my team leader. This one hour I spent writing a program. This one hour I spent in testing a program. These two hours I wrote documentation. This one hour I discussed with someone, someone. This kind of time sheet is required. The objective is not only that my productivity can be monitored, but the objective is also for the organization to know that to do this kind of project, how many person hours were totally required. Say 10 people are working for six months, Totally so many person hours are gone. But what is the portion which has been spent in design? What is the portion which has been spent in discussions? What is the portion that has been spent in documentation? And by the way, the software engineering fundamental principle says that typically the total project effort of this kind, only 20% of the effort is spent in coding. 80% effort is required in variety of other things in designing, in documenting, in reviewing, in testing. Because programs have to work. This is not like mid-same exam or end-same exam where you may get partial marks. Software is a binary business. Either the program works correctly or it does not work correctly. And if you are writing a programming system involving, let's say, 35 programs, which is a batch is writing 35 programs, one of those 35 programs does not work for some conditions, all 35 programs are useless. That is the hazardous thing. And that is why you require to apply engineering principles. These are the various activities that you will need to do within the course projects. Each student must submit the diary entries in the form of a common electronic document. We will be monitoring the work done by individual student because we are giving you the opportunity to give marks to yourselves. So obviously we have to have an independent evidence of whether those marks are correct or not. There are two mechanisms we are going to use. One is the written reports, which will be the project report. And since you would have been allocated explicit work, from the project report we can find out what portion of your work, how you have done it. The written report second component is your diary. So every day, every week, how much time you spent on which activity? That you'll have to submit. That is one part. And the second part, of course, is the viva, sample viva that I mentioned. So this is the, the format for this reporting has to be decided by the group. You have been writing C++ programs so far. You will now be writing plain English. And believe me when I tell you so, writing reports in natural language is far more difficult than writing programs in a programming language. That's, that's a fact of life. It is not the fluency of English language or something, but it is succinctly putting together the thought process that goes into the design of a program or how the program will work or how the user of the program will understand how the program is to be used, etc., etc., requires a lot of work. These are the submission processes. I will just, I will put this on the model. I just wanted to show you the two important deadlines. There has to be a weekly submission team-wise. So this will be a growing submission. I would suggest that each team makes a program, a project directory. Under that, it keeps sub-directories for each student. And any student who does any activity, 
writes a one page report writes a starts writing a program starts writing documentation whatever whatever should be done in that directory there could be sub directories in that directory all those four students or five students of a team will have a directory called team directory what we want every week is whatever is the status of those directories simply tar that directory recursively everything and if you have three teams you have three teams in a batch collect all the three tar files and make a single tar for the lab batch that is going to be your weekly submission that way my ta's and i will be able to monitor what progress you are making because if i compare two different tar files for two weeks i will know that this student who had written a 10 statement skeleton of a program has now extended it to 20 uh, 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 statement this student who was writing one page documentation has now one and a half page document that student who had written a two page documentation now has only one page documentation but when i read that i find that the two page was a draft this one page is a better document that is how progress is made and that is how progress will be monitored of course there could be a situation where nothing significant is added in week after week after week this will be tallied against your own claim in your diary that i spent four weeks writing this two weeks uh, two hours writing this four hours doing this etc etc so there has to be a sort of cross balancing i have changed the evaluation pattern slightly there are 35 marks for the project which is equal to the end semester weightage so please do take this very seriously the marks for the project report which will be submitted in two stages and evaluated in two stages will be allocated 20 marks each student of the lab batch gets exactly the same 20 marks i am not same 20 marks but out of 20 so if a batch scores let's say 17 out of 20 even the poorest performer in that batch in terms of the qualitative and quantitative contribution made will still get 17 as i said that is the beauty of the group work when i am part of the group good or bad whatever the group does collectively i get the benefit or i get the blame 15 marks however will be meant for each student's individual contribution and they will be based on 5 marks and 10 marks chunks these have to be arrived at through self evaluation and peer review process i had once mentioned that to you i'll explain in details later how exactly this needs to be done so this is roughly the process that based on the quantitative and qualitative contribution the way this is typically done is in a team the four people sit together with the team leader and each one says that look i think i deserve 4 out of 5 5 out of 5 or 3 out of 5 and then the team members discuss then these things there is some uh, sort of agreement that is arrived at and then the whole group sits for about 10 minutes all all 12 students and then the three team leaders coordinated way they work out these they review these marks as i told you last year i have seen cases where a student claim that last time they were out of 10 marks they had to give not out of 15 uh, the the student claim that i should be given 7 marks and people collectively decided that no that student should get only four marks and they could convince that student there are students who did not do anything in a project and they were given zero marks so you have to be very realistic and correct you need not be very harsh that is not required but you have to be realistic and correct and the relative work done by different people should be reflected in the marks that you give them anyway i'll i'll give a better write up than this that's all i wanted to Uh, say today uh, just one uh, repeat uh, notice uh, on sunday 10 to 12 for those students who were unfortunately not able to score more than 5 marks are required to attend the makeup tutorial which will be a problem solving tutorial under mentored conditions in the crescent building on the third floor sic 301 from 10 to 12 on sunday the saturday lab incidentally will continue tomorrow as scheduled labs do not have a holiday thank you